I'd like to take a quick poll of the room, have us get to know each other a bit. Now, these questions are a little controversial, but I do ask that you answer them honestly. So first question by show of hands, who here likes cilantro? OK. And who here thinks the taste of cilantro kind of makes them want to gag? OK. Question number two, who here likes dubstep or even loves dubstep? OK, a few hands. And who here thinks the devil quite literally created a genre of music, called it dubstep, and disseminated it to the masses? OK, some split opinions. Thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. So we all have differences when it comes to our senses. It's fascinating, right? One person listens to a piece of dubstep and they hear an audio masterpiece, and another person will listen to that same piece of music and hear an audio mess. The way we take in our world on a very fundamental level, a sensory level, varies wildly from person to person. Now, in the same way that we experience our senses differently from one another, people with autism spectrum disorder can experience their senses in a way that is very different from those who are neurotypical or those with typical cognitive ability. So, for example, what a neurotypical person might consider a light touch of a feather, a person with autism could find that to be a grating sensation. On the other hand, a neurotypical person might find the sensation of rocking their fists back and forth rapidly to be kind of chaotic, but a person with autism might do that because they find it very calming. Now, more generally, autism spectrum disorder is an umbrella term used to describe a vast array of developmental differences. And the word spectrum is really key when discussing autism spectrum disorder because it truly is a spectrum. So one person's autistic tendencies could look very different from another's. There's a whole range of verbal to nonverbal, intellectually delayed to intellectually gifted, high functioning to low functioning, with people falling all along somewhere in between. So describing autism neatly is difficult, but some common issues that people with autism face are difficulties in language, social interaction, and uh, social cues, and as I mentioned before, differences in sensory input. And here I really want to emphasize the word difference, because think of how we label those with autism and other cognitive differences. We give them words like disorder and disability. Every word carries a deeper meaning. And when we use words like disorder, it's easy for our minds to go straight to the negatives. And we skip over all the positives, and we miss out on all the good this population has to bring to our world. But instead of looking at cognitive disorder and seeing purely negatives, what if we leaned into the positives and recognized them as differences and not deficits? What if we celebrated and encouraged the differences that lie between the other and us? I'm part of a student organization here at Northwestern called Seesaw Theater. And in Seesaw, it is our mission to celebrate those differences. We devise and perform free, immersive, multi-sensory theater for children and adults with autism and other cognitive differences. We use our 30-minute window of theater to create a world in which our audience can grow and explore and be who they really are when the outside world often asks them not to be. And from doing this work for three years, using art as a medium to celebrate difference, We've discovered that not only is there no such thing as normal, but that when you change what's accepted and perceived as normal, you create something extraordinary for everybody involved. Our group's formula is pretty simple. We examine what makes people with autism different, and we adjust the typical theater model to embrace that difference. And what we end up with is pretty wacky. It's colorful, it's chaotic, and it's probably unlike any theater you've seen before. To show you what I mean, I'll explain the show I directed this past year called In the Game. At the start of the show, the audience jumps into the world's funnest video game, Hero University. Once everyone finds a seat on the floor, they meet Maggie, a superhero in training who's lost her sidekick, Kerfluffle. Maggie asks the audience for help, and we all go through the four levels of the game, getting a clue at each level as to how to save her side click. Sidekick. In the first level, we help Jacques Mustachio make a tea party by using our imaginations to turn everyday items into tea party objects. We then visit Sally in level two, where we help her tend her farm and we all sing a song together around the bonfire without using any words. In the third level, we help Astrid, a newborn star, build a galaxy. And in the fourth and final level, we help Casey return the groove back to Groovy Town by bringing all the light up groove balls back to the town's disco ball, which is obviously followed by a groovy disco dance party. Once we put together the clues after the four levels, we save Kerfluffle and save the day. Now, if you're seeing theater like this on a regular basis, I applaud you. But for most of us, a show like In the Game is kind of otherworldly in terms of the theater we're usually exposed to. So how do we start with autism and end with a groovy disco dance party? The key is in leaning into difference. 
The first difference that we face in Seesaw is that people on the spectrum are oftentimes nonlinear thinkers. So their minds may work more in a free associative style rather than a simple A leads to B, which leads to C manner. Now, this creates a major problem in the world of theater since so much of what we see depends on a complex linear plot where we follow a character on a sequential journey. So in Seesaw, we don't use plot to drive our show forward. Uh, in, in the game, we had a path to follow in that we visited four levels of a video game, but the plot didn't progress much further than that. Instead, we use what we call sensory experiences to accommodate that difference in sensory input I was mentioning earlier. So what does a sensory experience look like? Well, for example, in level three of In the Game, where we help Astrid build a galaxy, the actors start by bringing out all the ingredients that make up the galaxy for the audience to play with. Fire, ice, wind, and plants. The actors bring out hot and cold packs so the audience can play with temperature for fire and ice. Fans so the audience can feel the sensation of wind on their face and little balls with uh, fake moss on them so the audience can feel the roughness of the earth. Once the ingredients are put away, the actors then ask the audience to help them make the sounds of the galaxy by creating different abstract noises they think might live up in space. Finally, everyone gets up and pretends to be planets themselves feeling their bodies move in space and completing Astrid's galaxy. Now, this is the sensory experience on paper, but in reality, our sensory experiences go much deeper than what's simply written in the script. Actors and props are a key part of making sensory experiences, but in Seesaw, we plan all our design elements to be incredibly sensory and interactive as well. Our costumes are fun to look at and fun to play with. We've had a silk blowfish, a beard made out of string, and an entire costume that lights up. Our set, too, is meant to be very sensory, and so our theater space ends up looking a lot more like a playroom. We've, con we've constructed large domes, colorful pegboards, and felt walls with movable pieces for our audience to play with. We always include original songs at the beginning and end of our show so that the act of making sound can be a group activity. And DIY light bright walls and light up gloves make even something as intangible as light an incredibly interactive experience for our audience. In our shows, we invite our audience to play from all angles because connecting through play is of the utmost priority in Seesaw. Another way that we've changed our theater to fit our audience, and probably the most important way, is by allowing and encouraging our audience's impulses. We may have built the world of the show, but in reality, we truly are visitors in our audience's world, and so we want them to behave in their world however they see fit. So in addition to changing the structure of our show by de-emphasizing plot, we've also incorporated a new role in theater. Most plays consist of actors and audience. Our plays also include adventure guides. Adventure guides are the ones who make Seesaw a one-on-one -on -one experience. Our audiences are small, 10 people max, and we pair up each audience member with an adventure guide and the two stay together the entire show. And because autism is such a spectrum, we use our adventure guides as a way to cater the experience to each individual's needs. So if an audience member wants to spend the entire 30 minutes of the show running around nonstop, awesome. Their adventure guide will run right alongside them. Or if another audience member wants to spin around in her wheelchair instead of singing around Sally's bonfire, their adventure guide will make sure that experience happens. At the beginning of the show, we remind our audience to say yes please and no thank you when confronted with an object to experience, but other than that and barring any safety precautions, there really are no rules. All behaviors are correct because they are all coming from a genuine place. In our very first show of In the Game, we had a classroom come see the show together. We have an introductory area called an assimilation room where the audience can play and meet their adventure guide and uh, get themselves comfortable before the show begins. And we section off the theater space from the assimilation room using black curtains so the audience doesn't enter too soon. But that did not stop one boy. Let's call him Alvin. Alvin was a sweet little boy who had come to see the show with his class and upon arriving and meeting his adventure guide, Alvin walked right past the assimilation room and straight into the theater space. He had also somehow managed to get a large piece of chalk in his hand during this time and within seconds Alvin was chalking all over the painted walls of our set. It took six weeks to create in the game and about a year to design it, but it only took 30 seconds for our show to be vandalized. <laughs> and we loved it. As our set designer later said to me, he had wanted to create something that the audience could take full ownership of. And what better way to show that than by marking your walls with your own artwork? Where some might see a mess, we saw creativity and comfort. And that's what Seesaw does best, seeing beauty where others see chaos. In the outside world, there are certain expectations, social structures in place that keep us from following our impulses. 
I mean, think about it. If you saw someone running down the street in business attire, you would probably think she was running late. You'd be much less likely to think she was running because she wanted to feel the sensation of wind on her face or the racing of her heartbeat. Because let's face it, for someone to start running just because they felt like it, we would consider that straight up weird. <laughs> and how much of our daily lives consist of not doing something for fear of judgment? For people with autism, that judgment is present all the time, but the fear of judgment isn't always enough to stop them from following that impulse. In our society, that is both a blessing and a curse. Seesaw is one of the few places in this world where someone with cognitive differences can enter proudly and share their gift of impulse instead of feeling the pressure that they are cursed by their difference. So what happens when you use art as a medium to celebrate difference instead of attempting to turn it into more of the same? Well, scientifically, we already know that art is incredibly therapeutic for people on the spectrum and for all people in general. In Seesaw, we believe very strongly in enhancing our art by informing it with science. So we designated an entire position in our organization to doing research on our field and on Seesaw's work specifically. Our research base stems a lot from art therapy work. And while we're not an art therapy group, there's a lot of overlap in terms of our goals and our means of achieving them. One study conducted by Kathleen Marie Epp in uh, 2007 looked at a social skills program for kids on the spectrum that uses art therapy. And the study found that introducing art to the kids helped reduce anxiety, tantrums, and poor self-esteem. Another study by Courtney Weeder in 2013 found that playing theater games with the kids helped them identify emotions in others and get in touch with their own emotions as well, which, is, which are things that people on the spectrum struggle with on a neurological level. But it's difficult to look at Seesaw and see it as a simple reflection of science. The things we've seen in our shows tell us that there's something more. I cannot tell you how many times a parent or teacher has come up to us after the show to tell us how differently their child was behaving during a performance. A kid who comes in hating water will be the same kid who's stolen a spray bottle from an actor and is spraying everyone for minutes on end. Another audience member who suffers from severe anxiety in crowds can be found sitting right in the center of the action totally focused on one sensation and completely unaware of the surrounding chaos. People who never smile, who have a hard time connecting with others, who maybe never even talk, can be found in our show laughing, running, talking, and dancing. It's like magic. It's magic for our audience, it's magic for their friends and family, and it's magic for us as well. This past year, we were visiting a local special education school to play with the kids in their drama class. And uh, one of the adventure guides from last year's show, Sam, or Traveler Sam, as he was called in the show, entered the classroom. And upon arriving, one of the students said, hi, Traveler Sam. It turns out Sam had been this boy's adventure guide in the last year's show. Now, this is a nice enough story. But what's more, the teacher later told us that that student is normally completely nonverbal, doesn't say a word. Sam had built a connection with this boy about a year ago. And it only took seeing Sam's face again to prompt him to speak. Giving a gift of behavioral transcendence like that, it's frankly indescribable. In our very first year of Seesaw, we were visiting an after-school program for students on the spectrum where we go to do workshops. And we told them we were making a show for them, and we asked them what they might like to see. And one of the kids confidently blurted out, you should have a really well-developed backstory. Backstory is super important because you should always be asking why. <laughs> well. <laughs> My jaw dropped right to the floor. In two sentences, this boy had explained to me not only the purpose of theater, but the purpose of all art in general. Always be asking why. Since then, always be asking why has become somewhat of a motto in Seesaw. Every member of our organization has a reason for why they spend their days doing work with and for people with cognitive differences. Some people come in with siblings with cognitive differences, and many come in with zero personal connection to the population but everyone finds a reason for why they keep coming back to this new and crazy type of theater. <laughs> my personal why, why I enjoy doing Seesaw more than anything, and I know my generation tends to speak in hyperbole, but I truly do mean it is the favorite activity in my life. It's because Seesaw represents the kind of world I want to see. It's genuine and accepting. There is no right way to behave as long as you're behaving like you. I'm graduating college in just over a month. That big, scary, real world, the one I've been given and told to make better, is coming. And honestly, I look around and I'm sad and a little disappointed by the world I see. I want to see a world where people with cognitive differences, but also all people in general, are celebrated for the ways in which they are different. 
I want to see a world filled with more yeses and please teach me's and fewer stop doing that's and do as I do's. I am tired of hearing how people should be. I want to learn how people could be when given the chance to reach new heights within themselves. Seesaw is a new way of tackling an old problem, but it isn't the only way. I personally fell in love with Seesaw because it melded my love of theater with my value of acceptance, but acceptance can live anywhere. And there are those who say that working with people with cognitive differences is simply too foreign, it's too difficult. And I know that because growing up, I was definitely one of those people. But through Seesaw, I have learned just how wrong I was. Not only have I had the opportunity to play with and learn from some amazing individuals with cognitive differences, but I've also had the privilege of meeting their friends, families, and teachers who are just bursting with respect for and responsibility toward their loved ones. From all of them, and from my fellow artists who do Seesaw's work, I've learned that really the most essential thing when interacting with someone with cognitive differences is having an open mind. If they love mystery novels, ask them to teach you about the genre. If they love the feeling of a soft teddy bear on their face, give them that sensation of softness and watch their face light up. Try engaging in what the other finds interesting. You may learn something, maybe even something about yourself. At its core, celebrating difference is the simple act of allowing yourself to be both a student and a teacher. There is a whole world of untapped lessons that continue to go unlearned because we rely on what is normal. Let's change that. Normal is boring, but different, different is magic. Thank you. <laughs>